Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Rotem, and today, together with the violinist Elizabeth Summers, we'll play and talk about Dario Castello's Sonata Prima. Being acquainted with the musical repertoire from the 18th and 19th centuries, the concept of a piece for one melodic instrument, such as a violin for example, and accompaniment, is completely understandable. But in the beginning of the 17th century, where music was still very much polyphonic in its core, this was still rather unusual. In this episode, we will discuss how this soloistic constellation came about, and play and analyze the first solo sonata of Dario Castello. Let's start. On this channel, we have talked quite a lot about how vocal music, that was originally composed for several voices, in practice, was sometimes performed with only one voice and some instrumental accompaniment. We have also talked about how composers around 1600 started to compose and publish many pieces that were originally conceived and composed for only one voice and accompaniment, more specifically basso continuo. Interestingly, while it became more and more normal to have pieces with one soloist singer at the center of attention, in the realm of instrumental music, things were a bit different. Throughout the 16th century, vocal pieces were arranged into purely instrumental pieces, be it for one performer on a keyboard or lute instrument, or a consort of instruments. Especially common was the instrumental genre of the canzona, which included pieces originally arranged from old French chansons, and later original new pieces but with similar characteristics. Those pieces were naturally polyphonic and were imitative in character. When looking specifically for something more soloistic, there are examples of a practice of playing ornamented vocal parts on a melodic instrument while being accompanied by other instruments. But these are again arrangements of existing polyphonic vocal music, and not music written especially for this constellation. Something which is more original can be found in the small genre of solo ricercatas, original pieces truly for one melodic instrument alone that were sometimes included in diminution treatises. These pieces, however, may be seen as pedagogical etudes, summarizing the techniques learned in a treatise and not so much as pieces on their own. After 1600, when basso continuo was introduced, a new and fashionable instrumental genre came into being, consisting of music for three parts, two upper ones and basso continuo. Pieces having solely one melodic instrument as their focus were not there just yet. We do have, however, examples of pieces with soloistic sections, as in the beautiful Sonata in Dialogo by Salomone Rossi. The piece is written, like most of Rossi's instrumental pieces, for two upper parts and basso continuo, but according to its title, it seems to aim to imitate a dialogue between two characters, each having the chance to speak for itself, as it were, something that seems not so far from a soloistic recitative in a dramatic vocal work from the time. Let's listen to the beginning of the piece. This piece was printed in 1613, and it was just a matter of time until some composer would finally truly compose a piece for one instrument and basso continuo. Interestingly enough, Rossi never did such a thing, but in 1617, a younger composer, Biagio Marini, in his first music publication, included two pieces for solo violin or cornetto and basso continuo. This was the beginning of a series of publications containing similar solo pieces for one high instrument and basso continuo. Notice, however, that even in publications that included such pieces, they were definitely a novel minority 
in comparison to pieces for more parts. Now that we have a general idea of the place of solo pieces in the instrumental scene of the early 17th century, we can take a look at the first solo sonata of Dario Castello from 1629. The piece is found in the second of two books published by Castello, both entitled as Sonate Concertate in Stil Moderno. Let's see. Apart from what's written in Castello's publication itself, that he was a musician at the San Marco Church in Venice and was the head of an instrumental ensemble, recent research has discovered his full identity, dates of birth and death, and that both his father and brother were instrumentalists. Another detail declared in the title of the publication is that Castello's music is in modern style. The main features of what was perceived as modern style at that time was music which is made of short contrasting sections, differentiated by changes in compositional techniques, affects, meters, and tempi. The use of dynamics and dynamic effects, such as echoes, as well as the use of harsh intervals, which Renaissance theorists considered to be errors. According to Castello himself, in the preface to his first book, he noted that his pieces might demand a bit of extra practice and that he could not have made them easier while still using the modern style. Saying, in short, that pieces in the modern style are more demanding technically. Looking finally at the piece by Castello, we see its title, Sonata Prima a Sopran Solo, the first sonata for solo soprano. Sonata, at the time, was a generic title for an instrumental piece, often interchangeable with terms such as canzona or sinfonia, and sopran was a generic term for any instrument playing the soprano range. Beloved soprano instruments at the time were the violin and cornetto. We will perform it today with a violin. In order to do the analysis, we will use, for your convenience, modern notation. Looking at the entrance of the soloist part, we see that it plays some notes that are immediately imitated in stretto in the bass, and that the same notes also open the piece. Beginning a piece using a certain theme and imitating and repeating it is probably the most common way to start any instrumental canzona, only that here things are a bit quirky. As we have shown in our episode about stretto fuga, composing using this technique is like building a puzzle where each piece must fit perfectly to its surroundings in regard to its treatment of consonances and observance of the rules of counterpoint. Otherwise, it simply doesn't work. In Castello's stretto, weirdly, the pieces don't fit. They include a dissonance of a seventh. Unlike in some very expressive moments where breaking counterpoint rules is used as a tool to shock the listener, here we can't really point to a special reason for it. It might be that Castello saw this dotted figure as an ornament of the E, and thus didn't count it as real counterpoint. But however he saw it, it's clear that the traditional canzona-style imitations were not so important to him, as he very quickly concluded this section with the cadence and continued to something completely different. Let's listen to this short opening section. By the way, since it seems to me that Castello opened the piece in the manner of an imitative canzona, I realized the basso continuo using something that sounds like imitations, rather than homophonic chords. Now something completely different starts. Abandoning traditional polyphonic imitations, most of the music in this piece is based on melodic motives and their repetition and variation. We see how this opening phrase is repeated twice, once high and once low. And then only its last part is repeated ascending until it arrives at a new little motive. It all flows in a very elegant way until another cadence is reached 
that ends this little section. One may also look at it from the point of view of note values and see how it starts with some eight notes, is then dominated by 16th notes, arriving finally at 32nd notes, and then gradually slows down again. A really nice and well-composed arch. In the cadence, we can see an example of the harsh intervals I promised. At this dissonant cadential progression, Castello used twice the interval of a diminished fourth, called by some quarta tritona. The second one originates, like many jumpy early 17th century melodies, from leaping between voices of an imaginary contrapuntal framework, in this case of a four-step cadence or cadenza doppia. Let's listen to this section. The next section is in fact a variation of its former. It starts with very similar melodies and their repetitions, but in a ternary meter. It ends with a coming back to double meter marked with adagio with a big cadence and a little additional conclusion of the basso continuo. Let's listen. Adagio at the time of Castello, apart from sometimes being spelled differently, wasn't necessarily meant as just a slow tempo. It was sometimes connected with musical sections that are freer from the otherwise normal marching forward of the Allegro. This Adagio section is special, as it is followed by an Allegro marking in the middle of the playing, that together with the very well-designed acceleration of note values, may suggest a certain acceleration in the performance as well, from the free adagio to the sprinting allegro, finishing with a very fast and big cadence. Another interesting and modern aspect in the beginning of this section is the systematic leaping into dissonances, perhaps again assuming an imaginary polyphonic framework from which these dissonances are stemming from. Let's listen. After this extremely virtuosic cadence, we have another adagio section. Based on how it is composed, if it had been a vocal piece, the text would have probably been very emotional. It includes chromatic stepwise motion, descending parallel six chords, and at the end, another leap of a diminished fourth like we had in the former cadence, only that this time the bass moves and a seventh takes place. Crunchy. But the most strident violation of counterpoint rules occurs at the very beginning of this section. The top part prepares and becomes a ninth, okay. But then, instead of resolving it downwards, it goes up. And no, the short written out ornament that includes the G does not count as a sufficient contrapuntal resolution. Let's listen to this beautiful and expressive section. Thank you. 
The following Allegro section, apart from the short introduction in the basso continuo, is an interesting work of mix and match between short melodic materials. To show how it works, let's focus only on the line of the soloist. It starts with a sequence of five bars, each containing different material. Let's tag each bar with a letter for convenience. So, after presenting the full sequence from A to E, he starts again in a lower register. But this is interrupted after two bars, and the sequence starts again from the beginning, this time in a higher register. Despite having only one soloist, the effect upon the listener is that of several parts playing a fugal movement, each one in a different register. Castello goes on with sections B and C, followed by another B in a higher octave, which is then interrupted again by a new sequence of B to E in yet another register. To finish off, he repeats D and E with a little inversion. Before playing it for you, we should mention that this section includes six instances of the highly modern sounding diminished seventh chord. Such chords will become common in expressive recitatives of music decades into the future. At this point in time, they are really extraordinary. Let's listen. Very close to the end, the last allegro section in a triple meter begins. In practically every bar throughout this section, Castello repeats the very same sequence of note values. After taking two breaks and letting the basso continuo play alone for a bit, he just goes on and on, until starting a stubborn ascent, both in the soloist part and in the bass, which finishes with a big cadence. This is in fact the final cadence of the piece, after which there is a little coda. In it, as is very typical, the bass takes the fourth degree of the mode before coming back to the finalis. As we explained in other episodes, this kind of ending originates from holding the last note of the main melody while adding further consonances below it. Here, as a virtuoso instrumental piece, it is rather extended and allows the soloist to shine one last time before the piece ends. Notice how this bar doesn't actually make up four quarter notes. This is how Castello notated it both in the score and part, and it shows, I think, how this ending is not under the constraint of time, but only the virtuosity of the player. This adagio starts with some semi-imitations between the bass and the soloist and between different registers of the soloist, and it also includes the diminished seventh harmony we mentioned before. Looking at the very end, the penultimate harmony in such a plagal progression often calls for the sixth, but since in parallel places in other sonatas by Castello, he sometimes touches upon the augmented fourth with one of the parts, I decided to add it to my accompaniment. Such sizzling harmony is found in slightly later basso continuo treatises whenever plagal progressions are used. Let's listen to these final sections.
This was our show about Castello's sonata. We hope you enjoyed it. Huge thanks to Elizabeth for her beautiful playing. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information, where you can also find a link to the full performance of the piece. If you enjoy early music sources, feel free to support us on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.